If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 19. If you're a guest, we are preaching through the book of Acts. I've been preaching on it for a little over 18 months now, uh, but we are getting towards the end. We're in the final one-third of the book of Acts, and it's been a very good study, and I just uh, praise God for that. Uh, Today, I want to talk to you about special miracles, uh, special miracles, and you have to understand, folks, miracles are things out of the ordinary, miracles of things that man has trouble explaining, okay, and uh, we can see in the book of Acts, uh, Peter uh, and Paul had that uh, special anointing on their lives. Matter of fact, all through the book of Acts, you will see uh, Peter and Paul doing special miracles. Uh, Both of them healed a disabled man. Both of them cast out demons. They confronted magicians. They raised the dead and were miraculously released from prison. And they saw a great number of people saved. God truly used them in a mighty way. And uh, let me go ahead and give you the outline Special miracles. Number one, God's strong confirmation. God's strong confirmation. He was confirming Paul's uh, ministry today. Unusual Scripture. Uh, Some misunderstood uh, Scripture also. Number two, Satan's attempt at competition. Satan's attempt at competition. Whatever God does, especially in the miracle business, Satan tries to to duplicate that. And we will see that even more in the end times. All right? Uh, you know, the, 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 you know during, during the end times, just they have a, what I call an evil trinity also. All right? He duplicates uh, our trinity, and the Antichrist is going to be ahead of that. Uh, third thing, the Holy Spirit's powerful conviction. Listen to me, folks. When the Holy Spirit takes over, good things are going to happen. All right? And the verse that comes to my mind is, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Folks, spiritual warfare is real. You look at all that has been going on. Matter of fact, next week, I will be speaking on that issue about riots in Ephesus. On January the 6th, we saw something similar to that in Washington, D.C., and I'll be speaking on that subject. You know, in God's uh, holy word, you can find specific seasons where God performs special miracles through special men. You think of the time of Moses, uh, the ten plagues, and the parting of the Red Sea, and I've always said I hope he has a big screen, not 72 inch, 72 feet screen up in heaven where we can see that happen again. The time of Elijah and Elisha, all right, when he, uh, you know, faced those uh, 650 prophets of Baal, and he prayed and called down fire from heaven, poured water all over uh, the sacrifice altar, and whew, it happened because of God's power through Elijah. And then the time of Jesus and his apostle, apostles. Uh, And when Jesus performed miracles, he had four purposes in mind. Number one, to show his compassion. He was showing love through many of his miracles. Number two, to meet a human need. There was a need when there were 5,000 people. uh, Jesus preached all day and everyone was hungry. That's a human need. The third thing is to teach a spiritual truth. There was always a spiritual truth tied to every miracle that Jesus did. And the fourth thing is to prove that he was the Son of God. There were many in those days, especially the Jewish leaders, that doubted his deity. And and, uh, they all could see, they knew uh, what Jesus had done. Jesus' apostle followed some of these same patterns when it came to miracles. A miracle itself did not save anyone from their sins, but the miracles were directly tied to the message of the gospel and to the word of God. The absolute greatest miracle of all is when someone gives their heart and life to Jesus Christ. Let's look at these special miracles God allowed Paul to do through the power of the Holy Spirit. And you remember where we are in the text. Ephesus was a huge city with occult practices, 
and the worship of more than 50 pagan gods. It would be an extremely challenging place for the Apostle Paul to establish a church. So let's see in Acts chapter 19, verse 11, God's strong confirmation. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Unusual means these aren't normal things. You cannot explain them away. Verse 12, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Folks, I still think the, the apostle, you know, it was an apostolic gift a giving to Peter and Paul as they were establishing the New Testament church and establishing uh, Christianity. And Ephesus was the center of a lot of uh, satanic and uh, occultic activity. So there's going to be this battle of good and evil going on. And I know the first time Paul went through there, all right, I know he can sense that. Folks, I am telling you, I can sense when an evil spirit is around me. There is no doubt in my mind. And Paul knew that. And so he was in a hurry to get to Jerusalem. But I think his second thought on why he didn't stop in Ephesus and do the ministry then was, was because somebody needed to lay a foundation for his ministry. And as we've already studied, Apollos was one of those that did that and taught in the synagogues. All right? And and again, there were other people that had gone before him, Aquila and Priscilla, and they had started probably a house ministry of some time. So Paul, in uh, you know, giving the truth and, and doing his promise, came back and he landed there in Ephesus and he dug in knowing that there was going to be trouble. But God worked these miracles. Folks, man has no saving power Man has no healing power. Today we pray. The Bible tells us in James 5 to pray and call on the elders of the church. Anoint the bodies with oil. But I'm telling you, it is God that does the healing, not mankind. So we see these things going on. And, and looking at handkerchiefs and aprons, the things we have to understand, these things were used in the healings of these people. These folks said, uh, uh, Ephesus had seen uh, strange things that happened, the occult. And I'm, I'm going to talk about Satan in just a minute, and we're going, to, we're going to expose him for who he is and what he is about. But here, God used Paul so that it would uh, solidify his ministry and the truth of the gospel, and that it is God who does the healings. And here's the deal, folks. God can heal anyone any way he chooses. All right? And even I hear people say, well, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and someone died anyway. Well, folks, if they're a Christian, they were healed. They are better off than you and I this day. They are in the Shekinah glory of God. So don't take that when your prayers aren't answered that God doesn't care or He didn't heal. Folks, I'm telling you, He frees us from these bodies that are decaying. And, and the, the thing I remember, or the story in the Bible, when there's this huge crowd going along, and Jesus was teaching and walking through the streets, and a lady come up behind Him, didn't want to bother Him, and just touched His garment. And He knew. He did not look behind to see who it was at first, but He knew something had happened. And folks, that is kind of the same thing that was going on in Paul's life. Paul was preaching the Word. Paul was sharing the Gospel. His longest ministry was three years. Why? Because Ephesus was so wicked. It was a wicked town and, and the occult and pagan and idolatry and, and all kinds of crazy satanic things were going on. So he had dug in. So God used these things uh, for Paul and to solidify his ministry. It proved to the Ephesians that Paul's power was from God. Oh folks, we don't need to take credit for any answered prayer. When someone asks us to pray for them, we need to pray for them, but we don't need to say, it was my prayers that healed that person. 
Folks, it is God that heals. And these apostolic gifts were used for a specific time and a specific purpose. Let me remind you of Peter. Go back to Acts chapter 3. This is kind of the miracle that started all this after the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people were saved. Acts 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went together to the temple at the hour of prayer in the ninth hour. And a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask for alms to those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him, with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Peter had something else in mind. I don't even know if Peter had any money on him. But he said, look at me. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But what I do give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Folks, he gave him a gift from Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ. He gave a miracle and a gift through. God God gave it through Peter. And what, what would he want? Would he want money or would he want to be healed? Well, folks, I think it's obvious he was healed. He was lame from birth. He had never walked. Verse 7, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his ankle and bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked, entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Could you imagine if that happened here? Could you imagine what you what we would do? We'd just think, oh no, you can't jump. You can't raise your hand. You can't holler. You can't act like you're excited here. Why? We're worshiping. Oh, folks, put yourself in that man's place. You had never walked. Never. You would be making a scene down here just like I would. After about the third time around the sanctuary, you could stop me and say, hey, you need to testify. Why? Because God did the healing, folks. God is still in the healing business. Don't doubt God. God can do anything He wants to do. Now look at verse 9. And all the people saw Him walking and praising God. Then they knew it was He who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to Him. You know what? If I was Peter, I'd say, hey, hey, dude, come here. You need to hang out with me a while. I want you to give a testimony before I preach. I want you to give a testimony in the synagogues that I'm going to speak in. Why? Because the power of God's healing, folks. Folks, I have seen and I am ex- an example of God healing cancer. He can do it, folks. He can do it. And God was confirming Paul's ministry through these special miracles. Number two, and like I said, where God is working, Satan will always be close behind. And remember, God unites and Satan divides, folks. God unites and Satan divides. Look at verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it on themselves to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Obviously here there were Jewish exorcists. These were Jewish priests uh, that, that you know, you know, exposed demons in people. And obviously sometimes it worked. But there were other times I'm sure it didn't work. Because you have to understand, folks, Satan is powerful. Okay, he is powerful. He can do miracles. Remember the Egyptians, when Moses threw his, threw his rod down and it turned into snakes? What did Pharaoh's do, magicians do? They did the same thing. So they can mimic things of God. 
And you have to be careful about these things. Matter of fact, young people, I am telling you, you need to watch what you watch. You need to watch what games you play. There are satanic overtones in movies, in games, and in music. And you need to understand these things, these demons are for real and they are serious. They are serious. They want to possess your mind. They want to influence you in negative ways. So these Jewish guys thought, hey, you know what? Let's try this. We've seen what Paul is doing. Okay, we've heard about what Jesus has done. So let's give this a shot. And then verse 14 says, and there were uh, seven sons of Sceva, the G- a Jewish priest, chief priest who did so. Verse 15, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Oh folks, they are walking on dangerous grounds. You don't need to look at your horoscopes, folks. You don't need the tarot cards. You should not go to a fortune teller. Folks, those are evil spirits. Evil spirits and even fortune tellers many times can, can tell you, you know, they, they know some facts about you, okay? Whether they do it and find it on the internet or whether it's through evil spirits, do not mess with any evil spirit. You will lose, folks. You will lose. James chapter 2, verse 19. Let's look at a couple of scriptures here I want you to see. James 2, verse 19. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. You realize that the demons know who Jesus Christ is? Do you not think they were at the cross? Do you not think they thought He died? So folks, you can't take you know, you can't take these things lightly. You can't play with fire and not get burned. Do not do not mess with demonology in any form or fashion. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 11. Go to 2 Corinthians 11 with me. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 12. This is Paul speaking to the church at Corinth. But what I do, I will also continue to do that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in in the things of which they boast. Folks, anybody can buy TV time. Anybody can put a suit on and say that they're a pastor. I can get a doctor's degree online if that's what I choose to do. I can say I am anointed of God. I can say I have this healing power. I can say all these things. So we must discern. Discernment is the key. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And we need to discern who we are listening to and what we are doing. Look at verse 13. For such false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. I'm telling you, I, I, very often, very often, I start to present the gospel to someone. They say, well, I'm already a Christian. And then they tell me the story and, and, and you know, they give me answers and all this. But my spirit sometimes keeps saying, this is not adding up. So I, I, I really do. I try to pursue things. I try to get the whole story. I try to discern. Not that I'm judging that person. But folks, there's two ways I know when something's wrong. If it's against the Word of God, it's wrong. And if my spirit says, ooh, okay, he's saying the right answers, but something's not adding up. Folks, Satan is a liar. Satan is a deceiver. And look at the rest of this. And no wonder, verse 14, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. What do you think happens when someone decides to kill themselves? Think about it. Why do people commit suicide? Because they think there is no hope for their lives. And do you know what's standing right beside them? A demonic force saying, do it. Do it. And folks, it, it just it, it 
it just breaks my heart. Families that have to deal with that breaks my heart. And Satan wants you dead. He does. He can't take your soul as a Christian, but he wants you to take your life. Therefore, look what it says, it is no great thing if his, if his ministers also transform themselves into to ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. Do you realize that even Satan himself knows the Word of God? Satan quoted the Word of God. Matthew chapter 4, what was he doing? He was saying, hey, if you'll just throw yourself off here, the angels. He was quoting Psalms, folks. But you know what he does? He misquotes Scripture also. That's why you need to know Scripture. You need to know if what he's saying is true or not, or you will be deceived. Folks, this is serious stuff. Serious stuff. You know, spiritual warfare is serious, and you can be totally deceived. You can, you can be fooled by these uh, so-called angels and things. And folks, you don't need anything in your house. You don't need anything on your phones. You don't need anything on your computers that have satanic overtones to them. Now, back in our text. Let me read verse 15 again. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then the man in whom the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowering them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Folks, I'm telling you, that very spirit that they were trying to take an exorcist out of that man jumped on these seven people. This one demon against seven grown men. And I'm telling you, that demon beat them up, ripped their clothes, and threw them out of the house. Oh, folks, some of these movies, when I was a teenager, the, the movie Exorcist come out. All right? And I'm telling you, we snuck into that movie, and for weeks, I would lay in bed. And, and I'm just telling you, one night, my south window was open, that curtain hit me, and I, I'm telling you, it wasn't funny. I jumped in the floor because I was frightened. I was a dumb teenager. Making bad decisions, folks. And it is real. It is real. Now look what it says here. It, and, it, and let me just say this. It's just dangerous, folks. It's dangerous to play with evil forces. Matthew chapter 12. Go to Matthew 12. Go to Matthew 12 with me. I want you to see this. This is Jesus. He's fixing to speak. Matthew 12, verse 22. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute. And he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. So what did Jesus do? Him, capitalized, means Jesus. Jesus healed him. All right, Jesus' is power. And folks, I'm just telling you, you have the power within you to withstand uh, demonic oppression. You have that power, Okay. Satan cannot possess a born-again Christian. He can influence, okay? But he cannot possess you. So I don't want you to live in fear. I want you to simply respect. Don't be dumb. Don't, don't play with fire. You're going to get burnt. Even in another thing, remember those eight balls that we had when we were kids? Just those stupid little eight balls. That's, a, that's another thing that happened. Let's seances. We were at a church function when I was a kid, and we uh, they were they were out at this this cabin deal, and our parents were in there. We were out on a picnic table trying to call up some dead person, folks. I'm just telling you, we were doing these things out of ignorance. We had no clue, no clue. I wasn't even saved back then, but I'm simply saying, don't play with these things. Verse 23, and all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of 
the demons. What did the Jewish folks and the leaders say? Yeah, he, he did that. We can't deny that he did it. But guess who he is using? All right, He is using uh, the ruler of the de- uh, demons, Beelzebub. You know what Beelzebub was? His name meant Lord of the Flies. Okay? And they were slamming Jesus Christ. They were saying Jesus had evil powers inside of him. Folks, I'm telling you, when somebody goes against Jesus Christ, you need to get as far away from that person as you can get. They are walking on dangerous ground. Dangerous ground. Now look at verse 25. But Jesus knew their thoughts. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. What was Jesus doing? He was using logic. He was telling them, why would I use a ruler of the demons? That goes against everything that I am and even you. All right, They're giving credit to Beelzebub and Jesus. You have to decide which one are you going to serve, folks? You going to serve Jesus or are you going to serve Beelzebub? So even logically, it's not making sense what they're saying. They're giving credit, and what it was doing was it was again denying the deity of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, it was a slap in the face of Jesus. And it says, if Satan cast out Satan, is he divided against himself? Or how, how, how then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demon by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. He even turned on them again and told them even logically, why would you let them? Why would a demon, you know, the same thing, you know, the ruler of demons, why would you let that happen? Okay, it just wasn't making sense. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Folks, I am telling you one time in Lawton, Oklahoma, there was a lady that brought her daughter to me. She was a 14-year-old daughter, and she was lost. She was in drugs. She was a runaway. She prostituted her body. And she said, I've, she's been to counseling. She's done everything. And I witnessed to this lady, or this, this lady's daughter. And I am telling you, when I started giving her the Gospel, and I noticed when I uh, used the word Jesus, she would flinch. And folks, I'm 23 years old, second year in the youth ministry. And I had my Bible laying in front of me. And the more I went, I was going down the Roman road and I was doing John 3.16. I noticed she was just, she was making just strange noises and things were coming from her body. And then she started growling like a dog. And folks, it scared me. I literally took my Bible up and I set it in front of me like this. And I just started praying. God, I don't know what's going on here. But God, I need You. I need You. And she did this going on for... Folks, a minute in an office is a long time. And then all at once, it just stopped. And I just felt a peace come about. And I got to lead this 14-year-old child to the Lord in my office. And do you know what became of her? She started working in our church as a young uh, college student. And she started working in our nursery. And she ended up being a nursery coordinator in another church in Lawton, Oklahoma. Folks, it's real. Greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. Let's look at the last of this. Verse 17, back in our text. Oh, excuse me. I didn't finish that. I'm sorry. Back to Matthew. Let me finish this up. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Folks, we have to make a choice. Who are we going to serve? Who are we going to serve? Folks, I'm telling you, we need to serve God. We need to serve Jesus Christ. We need to be bond servants to 
God. Now I want you to see the last thing. Number three, the Holy Spirit's powerful conviction. Look what God did. Look what God did. This became known to both all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. They witnessed the power of these demonic spirits. They sensed there was something evil going on. And when these folks ran out of the house, I'm telling you, there was just this calming effect that happened. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Folks, that's why we have to give God the glory. We have to give God the glory. And many who believed came confessing and telling their deeds telling their deeds. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. Folks, I'm telling you, they were such conviction. The Holy Spirit was so strong. Conviction just hit these, uh, these people and realizing that they had idols in their house and they were worshiping idols and all this was going on. They brought it all in. And they counted up the value of them and it told them 50,000 pieces of silver. Folks, that is a lot of money. One other thing that I did when I was at Cameron Baptist Church as a youth minister, and that back in those days, we had albums. I mean, you know, literal albums and even the records. All right, we had this eight-track cassettes. All right, I'm kind of telling you how old I am here, okay? And I did a study on rock music. Okay, I studied, I, I, I listened to the music, I listened to the lyrics. Okay, there was a thing back then called backmasking. I don't know how many of you uh, know what I'm talking about, but you could take that and on a reel to reel, and I had one of our sound guys fix this up and, and reel to reel. What I had was in certain songs, you could play it backwards, and it would say, I am the devil. I am the devil. And they would say things. You know, just these satanic stuff going along. So I'm telling you, I got under such conviction as a youth minister. And I had a weekend where I brought the parents in. And I showed them what was going on. And I am telling you, they opened their eyes. And what I did the next Friday night, I said, hey, we're going to have a hayride and a bonfire. And I want you to bring your stuff. Anything that you even think has satanic overtones. Folks, you can look at some of these stuff that they have on, some of the makeup, some of the weird outfits that they have. They look satanic. And we took all that out and we burned that in a farm just east of Lawton. And folks, I'm telling you, I sensed a difference the next Wednesday night in our youth group, and that was when a lot of our youth started getting on fire for God and witnessing to their friends. Listen to me, folks. It's real. It's real. Verse 20, So the Word of God grew mightily and prevailed. Folks, Paul's bold preaching, God's Holy Spirit power was seen in Ephesus. Why do you think he stayed there that long? Because there was revival because people were getting saved, because the Holy Spirit and conviction was falling on that place. I close today with Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55, verse 6. This is a pro prophetic message. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Folks, that's what was going on in Ephesus. These folks admitted that they were toying around with satanic things and demonic things. And they took these things out and they just burned them up. And they got rid of them things. Verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts than your thoughts. Why would he say that? Because folks, everything begins in our mind. God has our heart. 
But the battle is our mind. And, and I'm telling you, Satan wants to plague your mind. Satan wants to influence your mind. Satan wants you to do these things that are against God. Verse 10, for as the rain comes down and snow from heaven and do not return there, but the water the earth and make it bring forth bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what it pleases and it shall prosper in the thing uh, for which I sent it. Oh, listen, folks, God's Word is powerful. The name of Jesus is powerful. Walking with God is powerful. Being filled with the Spirit is powerful. You don't have to bow to other gods. You don't have to let these other gods influence you. And that's what happened. I am telling you, revival broke out in Ephesus. And my prayer for you today, first and foremost, if you don't know Christ, I am telling you, you can be free. You can break free from the grip of Satan. You can accept Jesus Christ into your life. He can change your life. God is almighty. God is all powerful. And two, from the Christian perspective, Sometimes we just let things slide in. We just let things into our lives that we know in our heart of hearts do not need to be there. Folks, I'm telling you, there are shows on TV. I have flipped through and I've watched sections of that that are pure demonic. I sense that. I can't watch them. I just can't. And we need to filter those things we need those things in our, our lives. That's, that's what Paul was saying to the Philippian church. Okay, those things that are true. Those things that are honest. Those things that are lovely. lovely those things that are, are holy. Those things that are pure need to go through our minds. And we need to say no to Satan's temptations and yes to Jesus. Father, thank You for this day. And God, I just thank You so much for who You are. God, I just thank You that, uh, Lord, You are most powerful. And God, I pray if there's just one here today that doesn't know You, just one, Lord, I pray that they would just come forward. I pray they would invite You into their lives. I pray that uh, they would understand that they can be forgiven. They can walk away from here a different person. Then, Lord, I pray for the Christian. I just pray, Lord, that they would be more sensitive to these uh, evil forces and these evil things that are in the world. Satan is running rampant right now. And God, we do need to uh, do spiritual warfare. We do need to put on our armor every day. God, help us to do battle against the evil one. Help us to keep our, keep our hearts and minds pure, pure and holy. God, if somebody needs to come and follow you in baptism or join the church, God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to them this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rahel Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.